Hi, my name's um, Kim McGuinness. It's my absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm the CEO of Mentor Central, which is um, a business planning and mentoring organisation. We do all sorts of work, but by far my most um, valuable and important work is it, as, as Emma McTaggart's mentor. So that's absolutely the most important thing. And the first question I want to ask you all is, can I just have a show of hands who has been touched by mental health or knows somebody who's been touched by mental health? There you go, enough said, right? So this is a very, very important conversation. And when we take it forward to the workplace, um, we've got some alarming statistics, and I won't bore you with them all, but firstly, I wanted to define what a mentally healthy workplace actually is. And I found a formal definition, and that is that a mentally healthy workplace is one, one that protects and promotes mental health and empowers people to seek help for depression and anxiety for the benefit of the individual, the organisation and the community. So we all know what one is, so how do we make it happen? And just a couple of very quick statistics, only five in 10 um, people believe that their most senior leader values mental health. And one in five Australian employees report that they've taken time off work during to, uh, due to feeling mentally unwell in the past 12 months. Now, we wonder what impact that has on business. And according to a study by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, it's quite a big impact. 45% of Australians between the ages of 16 and 85 will experience a mental health condition in their lifetime. And it's estimated that untreated mental health conditions cost Australian workplaces approximately $10.9 billion per year. This comprises $4.7 billion in absenteeism, $6.1 billion in presenteeism, and $146 million in compensation claims. So it's a pretty important conversation, particularly if you're running a business, particularly if you're leading a business. Um, look, before I introduce our esteemed panel, I want to remind you that these people are incredible. The knowledge that they have collectively is unbelievable and it's impossible to share all the help that they can give you in the time that we have. So I encourage you, as we're going through, to think about some questions, because we will have some time at the end. So don't lose your opportunity to ask them a question. Obviously, they'll be around after the presentation, but let's have a discussion about it now. So I encourage you, if you have a question throughout, just jot it down, and we will get to it at the end. So firstly, Anna-Louise Bouvier. Oh my God, I didn't even know where to start. I had a, a bio like that from all the bits of information that I collected about this woman. What an incredible lady. She's created, built, scaled and sold two highly successful startups from her multi-award winning digital wellbeing joint venture with the ABC, the Happy Body at Work Corporate Wellbeing Program, um, to her two physio-sized practices that have collectively taught over 66,000 classes for people with bad backs and wobbly bodies, as she says. She regularly consults with organisations such as Optus, the ASX, PwC, CBA, ANZ, UTS and all sorts of other ac acronyms and appears regularly on Channel 7's new House of Wellness, the Today Show and Today Extra. She was the mind-body expert on ABC's popular Making, Cu Making Couples Happy and Making Australia Happy television series. She's released three DVDs and three best-selling books with HarperCollins and she's also an ambassador for September. Fascinating woman and welcome. Thank you. Troy Morgan is a wellbeing preneur, um, CEO of Willow, Willow's Health Group, director and shareholder at Vision Exercise Physiology, and a director and shareholder of Spring Day, which is a wellbeing technology platform based at Australian Technology Park in Sydney. And Anna, and that, that's the, the Connection evolution of, yeah. of, happy, of the ABC program. Mm -hmm. Um, Troy is also a business partner for Happy Body at Work, a program that's been rolled over to more than 20,000 employees in the last two years. Um, and his clients, obviously, lots of acronyms as well, all the same ones, ASX, Optus and Sydney Trains and the University of Sydney as well. And in his own sporting career, Troy has played over 50 games for Australia in touch football, this year adding another World Cup gold medal to his list. So welcome, Troy. And in the far corner, we have <laughs> Graham Cowan. Graham Cowan and his team help leaders and their tribes be more agile and resilient and avoid burnout, a big problem in our society today. He was motivated to create these programs because of his own mental breakdown in the tech crash of 2000. 
And earlier in his career, Graham worked in senior leadership positions for Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Morgan & Banks and A.T. Kearney. In 2000, he helped Gavin Larkin and a small team start Are You OK? And we all know about the Are You OK? Day and what an impact it's had. And he's a current non-executive director of that organisation. He's the author of three books in the Back from the Brink series and Thriving Naturally, a 30-day mood plan. He's a regular media comment commenter and has been interviewed on ABC TV and radio, the Australian Financial Review, Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, the Australian 2GB, 3AW, they love these acronyms, today, and many others. So please welcome Graham Cowan. Please welcome our panel. All right, now we know that a mentally healthy workplace is one that protects and promotes mental health and empowers people to seek to help for depression and anxiety for the benefit of the individual, the organisation and the community. The three layers are really important and particularly the community in, in, um, you know, uh, in many, many cases. And Graham, I know you've got a, an incredible story around this. Um, how do we make it safe for people to share at work without the threat and the stigma of mental illness? Yeah, that's a, a very good starting point. I, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I was working in a senior role, um, specialising in e-commerce back in 2000. Then the tech crash happened and our business sort of collapsed overnight. And when that collapsed, I also collapsed. And in a very short period of time, I lost my job, I lost my um, marriage, became estranged from my kids and had to go and live with my parents. And um, I don't know if anyone's any a Seinfeld fan here, but I feel a bit like George Costanza, you know? <laughs> uh, like, I really like George, but I don't want to be George. <laughs> um, and it was a very, very difficult period. Um, an understatement, you know, I tried 23 different lots of medication. I was had ECT or shock therapy on 20 occasions, hospitalised, tried, tried everything. And I was 110% convinced that I would never get better, which led to me making suicide attempts. And um, as I started to come out, well, and it was a long period, it was five years, you know, I really didn't ever see it changing. And uh, as I started to come out of it, it, it was... a you know, uh, multiple things, one of the really important things. Of course, I had good medical care, but it was committing to walk in nature. That was a really important element to me, and I really just resolved to do that. It started off at 15 minutes and built it up to about an hour each day. I reconnected with uh, family and friends. Um, I, Because when you're in that place, you feel really ashamed and you want to isolate, and, and uh, I did that as well. And then I, you know, I'd been away from work and so I started doing voluntary work and that was a really wonderful gateway back. I did volunteer work and it helped me and it helped uh, the group that I was working with. And then I really had this um, yearning to, um, to collect stories of people who'd been what I'd been through and who came back because it's one thing to read facts and figures but I, I really yearned for stories. and. It was a really important part of my recovery. I sought out um, people, well-known everyday people, interviewed people like the ex-West Australian Premier Jeff Gallup, the Olympic gold medalist John Conrad, and Patria Thomas, the marvellous icon of the art world, Margaret Ollie, and collected their stories. And it was, it was really inspiring stories of you know, what they learnt. And, and I think there's a real danger in just saying that mental illness is bad because... I have the most amazing and fulfilling life now, which I wouldn't have unless I'd been through that. Like it changed me, forced me to change priorities. And I've also learned that my story is very, very influential because it allows other people to share their stories. And I think that's the key to breaking down stigma in workplaces. Because when I share my story, it gives people permission to share theirs. And always after an event, people either come up straight away or afterwards and talk about something, you know, something that's happened to them. And that's how we break down stigma, like what, what um, Kim did before, getting people to raise their hands. I always do that. And it's the same. Every single audience, it's the same. People have been touched by it. But when, what I also like to do in the, in the workplace events I do is to have someone else from that organisation, if they're ready 
and they feel willing to share their story. It's one thing for an outsider to share it, but it's another thing for someone inside the organisation to do it. And I remember doing it with one of the big banks once, and we, we, we knew of a person, and he was very willing to share. And so I told my story, and then he told his story. And he, he'd really crashed and burned about 10 days ago, or 10 years ago, and then decided to put it into exercise. And this, he <laughs> put it into exercise to the nth degree. He'd done three Hawaiian triathlons, you know, the most elite of the elite. And no one, so no one knew about his mental health past. But when he shared that, suddenly everyone else felt free to talk about what was really happening in the workplace, their workplace. They talked about not being able to sleep, talked about you know, un unrealistic demands and that sort of thing. So the stories and, and the acknowledgement of how it touches us all is the first step. Fantastic, Graham. And you know, when Graham says he walks in nature, I mean, he really does. He's climbed Mount Everest. Um, he's done the Inca Trail, the Kokoda Track, the Camino and a hell of a lot of others. So, yeah, walking in nature is obviously a very big part of, of your recovery and I, you know, congratulate you um, for taking the leap and, and getting past it. Um, exercise and mental health, that leads us perfectly onto um, how they're interlinked and how should the workplace be doing a little bit more to encourage it. I think, um, I guess my original training was as a physio, so I guess I've really come at the mental health story from the physical. And I think often the conversation tends to be much more about, you know, the mental aspects, sort of forgetting that there's a body wrapped around our minds. And, you know, if you're not sleeping, if you don't exercise, if you sit all day um, and you don't sleep and you go to bed late and you take your phone to bed instead of your partner um, and you eat crap food, <laughs> your mind's not going to be great. And, and I think, you know, it, you can wrap a lot of sophistication around it, but it basically comes down to very simple things. And certainly in the work that um, we started to do with Happy Body at Work, um, it was about trying to make it simple, like simple... Um, whether it's in the workplace or whether it's at home, you know, the person that you are at work you take home and the person that you're at home you take to work. So I often think the discussion around workplace mental health is really about life mental health. Um, and so we came up with this thing about messy and magnificent. And, you know, when you are messy, um, you know, you don't sleep well, um, you're probably your energy is low, your mood's not great and your ability to cope with stress is decreased. When you're magnificent, you know, you're the opposite. Your energy's great, your sleep's great and your mood will be good and you cope with stress better. The thing is to recognise that when you're having a messy day, that energy and sleep are levers that you can use to actually change how, how messy you're feeling and push you towards magnificent. And the hardest thing is that when you are having a messy day, you're often very tired and the easiest thing to do when you're tired is, you know, lie on a couch, grab a glass of wine or a beer and, and sit, which actually makes you more messy. And so sort of in your head on those days when you're having a messy day, it's counterintuitive but sometimes just, you know, going for a little walk around the block outside with some fresh air or just going to bed a little bit earlier or, or something like that are actually the most powerful things. And I think in a work environment, you know, if you're on your feet all day, it's actually a big plus. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you'll come home physically buggered, but physically buggered is actually a better kind of buggered, you know? Mm. Whereas, sorry, I grew up in Griffith, so buggered <laughs> is a perfectly okay <laughs> word. Um, I'm told, we filmed one day at the ABC um, and I rang them and said, you know, I talk about being busy, bored and buggered and, and, you know, how those three things affect you. And we rang the ABC and said, we're about to film this and we're going to use the word buggered. Is that okay? And, and the head producer said, yeah, God, you know, everyone talks about buggered. Well, that was fine until we sold the series to um, Abu Dhabi. And, um, <laughs> It turns out the bucket isn't quite as relaxed as <laughs> Anyway, there you go, just a hot tip next time you film. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly when you are, when you are buggered, you know, thinking about, um, uh, you know, at work if you see somebody that is tired, often um, it's about, um, you know, going for a walk around the block. 
um, or letting that person go home early or maybe starting to explore some of the physical things because they're much less scary to talk about. You can actually have an are you OK, you know, are you tired conversation mm. much more than are you OK, do you feel like you're going to have a nervous breakdown? So, you know, and often it could be, you know, kids that are waking up in the night, um, menopause, you know, that's giving you hot flushes, um, except if you're male. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's lots of reasons that people can be tired that can really lead to poor mental health that are very fixable. Very good. What do you think about walking meetings? I love... In fact, Graham and I are just going yeah. on a walking Book meeting. Book one. Yeah, do you know <laughs> Yeah, it's good. I love them. Yeah, I, I think shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder conversations are very... Great. Like if, if, you know, if you've ever got to have a really good go at one of the kids, like in the car is often one of the best <laughs> things because you're not actually looking at them. Um, I think, you know, with colleagues, if you've got to have a slightly difficult conversation, a walking meeting is a great way to have it because when you sit across, you know, the, the table at someone, looking into their eyes is very uncomfortable, whereas going for a walk... Often it just comes out, mm. and I find that very, very strong. It's interesting, um, I found this, this point. In the early days of the Huffington Post, many of the best ideas came from walking meetings. And as the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said, I've walked myself into my best thoughts. Yeah, that's, well, I, thought, a that's a, I love that. And it's so true, you know. We, we, we come up with our best ideas when we're walking or we're, you know, even standing. Just get up. I and think that's I think the biggest thing. that goes to possibly not as much in the bush, but certainly in the city, there's still in, in big organisations a, a thing that you're not working unless you're at your desk um, or at your computer. And in fact, that's when you do your best work. I mean, we were all talking about this the other day. Your best work's often when you're not at your desk and you're not at your computer and that you do go for that walk. And if you do feel stuck, often that's the best time to get out mm. and, you know, because then your brain has time to relax and those good ideas come. The fabulous book called Deep Work, which I think we've all read, <laughs> so it's a, I re highly recommend it. Um, Troy, does play translate to mental wellness and how does a playful workplace place contribute to wellbeing? Um, first of all, we probably, uh, when people saw that I was speaking at this event, they asked, well, why does the workplace have to play a role in, in individuals' mental health? And, and I spend my whole life speaking around Australia, and, and when we start to think about thinking outside the box about issues, I, I say to the audience, in the 70s or 80s, if I said, when you went back to your desk, you wouldn't be allowed to smoke, you would laugh at me. Mm. It, it took a paradigm shift in the workplace to change our thinking about smoking before it, it filtered through to the rest of society. Mm. So the workplace, is going to play a big role in the paradigm shift in how we think about health and wellbeing, because that's where we spend the majority of our, our time. And, and to get people to engage in that, and when you mention play, from a health professional's point of view, that sometimes is the opposite to how we speak about our message, because we come from a compliance background. You must do this, you must stop doing that, and we're actually shutting people's brains down to what we're actually trying to do. So we've been very much built on, on that sickness model um, that I think the health, Queensland Health Commissioner put it very well mm -hmm. last night where he said, we've built our model on the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. We wait until people fall off the edge. So that, that play word within the, in the workplace um, can scare some, some people, but it's, it's around actually providing incentives for people for how they can get involved. Um, and when we talk gamification, it's not just around around games, but actually being able to direct people's experiences. So it's, it's a very individual journey, uh, mental health and also wellbeing. So being able to create one solution that fits all is very hard. So we tend to try and commoditize it where you, you put all these ingredients into the box and here's this beautiful solution at the end that's going to fit, fit everybody. It just, wellbeing just doesn't work like that. So being able to, to gamify the process by producing um, questionnaires and, and programs that actually technology can allow the content to be pushed to people based on their experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you start to, to gamify those experiences, people start to become involved with it. But how do we reward and recognise people around that? People are, are motivated by different things. And it, it's, it's really interesting, and particularly through the age groups. So when we look at rewards and recognition, 
For some people, it's getting a gift card for, for doing a particular program where they can go and buy something that they feel. For others, it's, it's an experience. For others, it's maybe being able to give to charity. So, so being able to use gamification and play and actually embracing technology for good, um, it allows to scale those type of solutions in, in the workplace. So, so creating games around it really, really creates a higher engagement level. Um, and we're seeing that in, in the work we're doing with, with different organisations. And how do you translate that to, for example, I'm running a business that has, I'm not talking personally, I'm just hypothetical, running a business that has, say, 10 employees, and we have to smash the work out because we've got deadlines. Yeah. How do I balance play and productivity? Yeah, it, it is a, it's a, a really big balancing act. And, and I think um, the larger enterprise organisations are in the same position as the, as the mm. smaller, smaller enterprises. Um, there's been a lot of money invested in those larger organisations in content that people aren't using. And it's the same for the smaller organisations, councils, local governments, mm. the federal government have invested a lot of money and resources that people aren't actually using. How, how do we actually connect people to the resources that are, that are there? And it's not going to be done through compliance. It's going to be creating um, conversations around how we can actually make this technology available to everybody so it can actually direct people through to that. We're having a conversation with the South Australian Health Minister in two weeks where they're looking to build a platform for smaller businesses to tap into because they've invested so much money in all these resources that no one's using because people don't know where they need that help. And, and gamification and play can actually help people connect to those, those resources that, that they need the support, but they don't know they need that support mm. because we're waiting till they fall over the cliff. So how can we change the conversation? And, and gamification and play can play, play a big role in that. I'm a huge fan of um, that team leaders are the key to changing business and changing well-being in business. And I do a, a session in my, in my talks where, and it's a live vote, people can vote on their phones, and I ask them to vote on if we all strived as much as realistically possible to have a more caring and optimistic team, how much would that improve our performance? And people vote anonymously they can't, and they can't see the result. Then it comes up, the most common vote is 50% or more productivity. 50% or more productivity. And then I recently surveyed my um, database and asked them, okay, if it is this more productive, what are the things, what are the things that we need to do? And I asked people to rate across a number of things. And the top five <clears throat> with this is that, number one, we don't, we don't uh, tolerate bullying. That was the number one thing that people voted. Number two was that we value performance and well-being. And well-being. Number three was we ask, are you OK, when we see that someone's not in great shape? And, you know, as a one, someone who helped us out, are you OK, it was just fantastic to see that it's become part of, part of the vernacular. So that was number three. <clears throat> number four is that we can be authentic at self, at work. We can be our true self. And we are going to be much more resilient, much more productive when we can be our true self to work, when we do encourage diversity. And number five was we enjoy ourselves. <laughs> we enjoy ourselves. And when I ask people to reflect on the best team that you've ever been in, be it um, you know, your year nine netball team or your footy team or working at McDonald's or your current role or your past role, what was it? What was it that made that different? People always come up with the same things. They always talk about, you know, we had each other's back. We had complementary strengths. We had a common purpose and mission. Um, we had fun. You know, this is what people say. So people have had this experience and they rate it that it increases performance and productivity by that much. Now it's just a matter of team leaders realising it, recognising it and taking steps to do it. And the most effective way they can do that is to model it themselves, <laughs> to lead a life themselves that, uh, you know, that keeps themselves in good shape mentally. Um, and we have to do it because the CSIRO has, just two months ago, said that rising, mental, uh, w rising work stress and mental health issues is going to be one of the top six megatrends shaping workplaces for the next 20 years. 
So we can't do things the way we've always done. We have to do things different, including digital. But most importantly, people have to have the courage to lead by example and to live a life that is you know, full of joy, full of fun, full of gamification, trust and respect. Um, yeah. How can we use technology? You know, we were talking about smartphones and, and the overload of smartphones yesterday and taking your phone to bed instead of your partner and all the rest of it. And you're doing so much good work with, you know, technology and using it as a platform. And, you know, we've, as a, we were discussing last night, um, the, the latest trend in hot desking and getting everything... Um, you know, efficient and, and perfect and all that sort of stuff. Um, there was a 2010 study by Alex Haslam from the University of Exeter in England and he found that just allowing employees to choose how many plants and photos they wanted in their office environment was, you know, a huge indicator of productivity. Um, productivity went up by 32% compared to employees that were given no choice. Um, so owning our space and, and understanding where we fit in the organisation is really important. But, you know, on the flip side, that need to always be connected and the boss going, well, I need to get hold of you whenever I, whenever I blink, um, it doesn't really work, does it, Troy? No, it certainly can be overwhelming. And I, I think if we had a show of hands of who answered a work email last night, I think there'd be a lot of hands, hands going up. So... Um, it, that, that merger, technology has merged our personal life with our, our work life and um, I listen to Anna Louise speak uh, often um, and, and what we did was we, we, ju we just pushed that sleep thing away because we still want our social life but the work life's moved into it so we just shorten up our sleep and I, I, and I talk about my father's lifestyle growing up where he had a nice compact life where he had work yeah. Social life and this amazing thing called sleep, which we all need to go to a museum to look at now, what that, <laughs> that actually looked like. Mm. So how do we harness the power of that technology to actually be part of the solution? Um, and, and the projects that Anna Louise and I are working on with, with Optus at the moment is harnessing that technology to actually direct the journey for the employees so they can actually navigate to find the, the solution they need. Because we're overwhelmed with everything happening in our lives and we're overwhelmed with information. How can we use technology to cut through that by, by engaging with it and then the technology pushes the support to you that, that you need? Perfect. Mm. Um, and that's Love a really that. interesting project that we're working mm. on at the moment. And, and, and Louise, you could probably talk about the journey and, and the development around that. Yeah, it was interesting. So when I first started um, working in, in wellbeing, I thought if I made a series of videos and PDFs um, that told people everything they should know in the workplace that would make them well, that that would not only be fantastic, but that people would watch them. And sadly, I found out that nobody did. <laughs> um, and that was, you know, it looked beautiful. I mean, we made these weird videos with the ABC. They were absolutely fantastic. Nobody's got time to watch them. And the only time you will start looking for stuff is when you feel terrible. You know, when when you have fallen off the cliff, you know. But it, if life is so busy that, that just knowing what you should do doesn't actually make you do it. You know, we all know we should, you know, drink less, eat better, exercise more, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I'm also trying to balance kids and work and all that sort of stuff. It just feels like too much. So instead what we feel is guilty rather than, you know, doing something. Um, so when we then started to work on... Um, the next project, we started to look at, at, at getting people to interact with um, the technology. So this was in a team-based kind of gamified way, which is what Happy People was all about. And it was about tracking how messy or magnificent you are every day and starting to think about every day just going, how's my energy today? How's my mood today? You know, how's my sleep today? And how's my stress? And just that action of every day thinking to yourself, how am I? actually starts to get you to think about, well, what is the connection? Actually, my mood, like a midwife that we were, we were working with, we did a huge rollout with the Department of Health in Victoria, and this midwife said, oh, my God, 12 days in a row, my mood is terrible. And she said, but so is my energy and I haven't slept. And she said, suddenly I just realised mm -hmm. that those three things went together. So I think for us, connecting it was the first thing. But then 
we realise that actually it's not just about mind and body. It's actually about mind, body, your social life, your connection to community, um, finances and work. And it's those five interactive pillars um, that actually brought us to that, that next step. And I thought it was very interesting yesterday, last night, when we had the opening and the Mental Health Commissioner and you, Derek, were saying so much about community, volunteering, connections. Um, you know, this community is, is quite unique um, in that conversation, that you've taken that social pillar and really push that, knowing that that is actually probably the keystone of the other five pillars. Work, you know, the nature of work, you going back and volunteering, you know, how important that is. So uh, it's quite interesting that I came at the conversation from, from the body pillar, and, and like everything, whatever pillar you come from, you think that's the most important. Mm -hmm. And the more that I've actually gone into this conversation, the more I realise actually it's, it's not the the keystone, you know, that actually probably social and connections is probably the keystone. But it is a leg on the table. It is, the, it is absolutely, and, the table and it's another lever. I, mm. You know, I just think, I think mental health is like a graphic equaliser in my head. It's, it's like I've got those five things and if I can, if I can, you can see how old I am, probably the younger people don't even know what a graphic equaliser <laughs> is, but, um, you know, but just, you know, thinking about balance in terms of, you know, turning the push up on something and bringing it down is how I think about, you know, the response. And the I think mentoring, sorry. sorry Kim, uh, the interesting thing with, with Graeme talking about the leaders, the, the data that starts to flow through from that is, as Anna Louise said, with the graphic equaliser, the leader can actually start to see where their team's struggling the most at different yeah. points. Oh, that's useful. Yeah. At different points in the team's journey. So the, the leader then is actually getting significant data that they can actually act on rather than guessing. A lot of the time we guess yeah. and we put an intervention on top of our team or our workplace and go, well, this is going to work, but we don't actually have the data to understand where the help is needed. So, um, so for instance, Optus retail, right, if you, if, you, if you look at them as a group, um, they're young people, 25 to 50. So social-wise, they actually came up really high. They were, they were really connected. Work, most of them at uni and stuff like that, so that, you know, that was kind of fine as well. Um, finance, terrible, they're all poor. Um, body, terrible, they all eat terrible food and don't exercise. Mentally, they're not bad, right? Then you look at the corporate results, so one of their corporate um, sector pillars. Finance, great, they're all learning a lot. Um, work, often quite good, except you know, people are always worried they're going to get retrenched. Um, social, terrible, no time to connect with people. Physical, maybe not too bad but not great. Mental, terrible. You know, so their graphic equaliser looks completely different. So the intervention that you would put in for them would be completely different to what you would put in with a, a you know, bunch of retail kids. The social thing is, um, you know, there's always those differences and stuff, but it, but it is a really, really big issue. I just um, was presenting some research this week and the media talking about the lucky country has now become the lonely country. And, you know, there's much more connection. I come from a country town and, you know, in a, in a regional city, I'm sure there's much more connection. But surprisingly, that wasn't reflected in the research. It said 53% of Australians are vulnerable to loneliness, 53%, more than half. And the loneliest state was uh, New South Wales, followed by Victoria. And the less lonely was, was Queensland, maybe no surprise there. So Vict I think New South Wales was 58%. Queensland was 49%, but either way, you know, 50% of us had the, had the vulnerability to be lonely. And loneliness is a massive health issue. You know, uh, researchers in um, the UK estimate it has the, uh, the detrimental health equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes per day. In the, in the UK, they now have a minister for loneliness. It's that serious over there. And um, so, you know, what you've done here, what Emma and the organising committee has done here is truly amazing. And I believe that it's, it's leaders like that 
whether it's in communities, whether it's in workplaces, that, that can really help to change things, can really make a great difference. Like, we've had Are You OK going now for 10 years. And, you know, there's some just really amazing things happened this last year. After our 10th year, I was flying back from Canberra to, to uh, Sydney and someone came over the road, like, came over the, the Virgin um, PA, you know, we'd like to remind you that tomorrow is Are You OK Day. It's really important to us at Virgin and we'd like to encourage all of our passengers to reach out to those important to you and have important conversations. There's another amazing community example, which we, which we only learned about after, after the actual day. A woman in um, Ugooga. Anyone heard of Ugooga? It's a little town just north of Coffs Harbour on the, on the coast, about 5,000 people. An amazing woman there called Lisa Nichols to this event called Whoopi Wears Yellow. <clears throat> Everyone in the town wore yellow. Every shop front had Are You OK displays. They even had the whole town mark out Are You OK on the beach and had a drone that take it. You know, it's that sort of extraordinary leadership that can make a, make a difference. So, um, you know, or each of us can play that role. Each of us can play that role in our, in our teams, or teams or our social circles, and just try to encourage that connection, because that connection, I think, is paramount to physical health as well as mental health. Absolutely. Um, we briefly touched on food, and I'd like to bring that up. I mean, what's the employer's role here? How, how much, and, you know, our diets obviously, I'm sure, could be better. On, on most, and, and we know that food contributes to mental health issues um, in many ways. You know, we were discussing last night how a, a business can use food as a team building activity and learn to cook together and do all that sort of stuff. What's the employer's responsibility and what would make a workplace better in regards to food? Um. I, I think one of the big issues that we see around food is, um, it's funny, like sometimes I'll go to a workplace and they have the, you know, the bench full of those lollies that everyone has to buy for charity. I think we could get rid of those quick smart because I can't resist a caramello bear. <laughs> um, uh, you know, certainly having lollies and stuff like that accessible is, is really hard because if you've got to choose between an apple and a caramello bear when you're tired, you'll go the caramello bear every time. So it's about when you're not feeling great, unless you don't like caramello bears, then, you know. Um, but I think also a big reason on why we make bad food choices is when we're already tired and stressed. So particularly in um, organisations that have a lot of shift work, we see that as a major issue because if it's the middle of the night and you're at the hospital or you're at the mine or you're whatever and the canteen's not open and your only choice is the vending machine that has, you know, Coke and chips and stuff like that, you know, and you haven't had time to make yourself something healthy, then you will choose that and, and you get addicted, you know, that there is a, a, a cycle of, of um, addiction. So I think um, there's a responsibility within workplaces, particularly that have 24-hour um, things, to really um, allow some good choices um, to be made. Um, but I think we, we also need to look beyond that and go, well, why aren't we making those good choices? And we were talking last night about how, you know, my personal thing is that I reckon you should bring back home economics. I think, you know, everybody should know how to boil an egg and, uh, um, you know, do some really simple meals that, that cost you very little and, and can, I mean, this is what Jamie's Food Revolution's mm. doing in, in uh, England, is about getting people to, to recognise how cheap and easy it is to cook. But having said that, I don't think you could ever cook teach my husband how to cook but um, you know he, he you know he will grab a banana you know or something like that so I, I think there's there's food is the most complex mm. part of, of the equation yeah, I think some of the biggest impacts I've seen is it, are those face-to-face -face, um, Ruth Logan's a, a colleague of mine and I'm sure former people have heard of, of Ruth Logan and I, I see Stuart and Bella the new hope guys here and and they've had experiences with, with Ruth actually coming into the work site and doing cooking classes. And, and I've seen Ruth do those cooking classes. And it, it's amazing that, that some of the guys have never actually cooked before. So just the impact that has in a, in a simple, 
simple way of face to face and that social connection mm. and, and it bringing all of those pillars together that it's not just it is that social connection once again but learning around the mm. nutritional component um, and just simple things yeah. big return on investment compared to, team. Tr compared to trying to make mm. big impact every single time with the, the, the money and the budget that you do have mm. So uh, Felice Jack has done a, uh, from Victoria's done a lot of work about nutrition and mental health, and particularly for young people. And she's looked at the difference between um, young people that consumed a processed diet and a whole foods diet, and everything else being equal. Those that, con that consume a whole foods diet have 54% less in mental health issues, anxiety and depression. So there's literally no doubt. And I think the big thing is in the workplace is just having the availability. Mm. Because um, just having the availability, I reckon, is 80% of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And check there's nothing that you're allergic to as well. I think that's really important um, because quite often it can mask depressive symptoms. Do we have any questions from the audience for our lovely panel? Madam. It's interesting when we, um, a lot of the survey, we, we so in every um, survey that we do um, when, we, when we go into a workplace, so we've now got about 40,000 pieces of data um, where we look at everything, you know, across like the things that stress, you know, what would people describe as their greatest stress, stressors um, in the workplace? And the, and the three biggest things are lack of time at work, lack of personal time and the inbox. Right? And remember that we're doing a lot of sort of um, corporate environments. But even, even in pe you know, people who are not in front of computers, it's kind of like the, the competing demands thing. I think, personally, I, I think a lot of our work practices aren't great. You know, the way we work, and we talked about this in that book, Deep Work, the way we work is often expanding our boundaries, you know, because we can keep working on our phones and because we work when we get home and because we've got our laptop really accessible and because people kind of demand, like it, it's not as cool to say, I finished, now I'm going home. Um, in whatever, you know, workplace you are, I, I, I think um, we need more training in how to work um, to be, to have more efficient practices. Um, you know, just learning how to deal with inboxes, whether it's time boxing your time more, which is kind of um, one way to do, filing, um, uh, you know, knowing how to be more, more efficient, but not for the sake of then filling it up again. Um, but, but I think the, the nature of work has really changed. We're asked to do more. A lot of people, we just don't have the skills to do, and so it just pushes out into time rather than than the way that we work. I, yeah, I worked a lot of my life in um, recruitment, outplacement, career coaching. And, you know, there are definitely people that do have an addicted mentality with work and it's a diversion thing. They, they you know, do it to fill some emptiness or some holes in some other part of their life and it d does definitely need to be addressed. But work can also be incredibly good for us and you've only got to speak with people that are unemployed to know how terrible it can be when you, when you don't work. And so I think what Anna-Louise Anna said about knowing how to work is a really important element. You know, knowing what our strengths are, knowing how we can use those strengths, knowing how we can work in a way that, um, uh, that is good for us. And all, you know, all the science on productivity says you should work in bursts, you know, where you work intensively for 45 minutes, then take a break and do something completely different. And, uh, you know, 
endless work is not the solution, but work isn't the enemy as well. Work is like a really important my recovery was doing the voluntary work on the way back to to paid work. So it's it's so much addiction is bad, but I think it's more knowing how to work and what work to do that is really good for our mental health. And I get a bit upset when people talk about work-life balance because it, it assumes that work is bad, life is good. <laughs> but, you know, when you do find your calling, it doesn't feel harmful to do it, providing, of course, you, you know, still have time for the, the, the most important things, which is your, you know, your physical health and your relationships. Agreed. And I also think there's a bit of FOMO, um, a bit of fear of missing out when, you know, you think, oh, I can't miss that email and I've got to make sure I'm on it and I've got to be, show up my best all the time. And I think that's a leadership thing. I think, um, you know, when I had um, my business network, which I ran for 16 years, I had a staff of about seven people. And, you know, at six o'clock every night, I'd say, right, go home, be with your families. I don't want to hear from you until tomorrow morning. And I think that there's a, there's a responsibility as a leader to say, it's OK, go be with your family, go, you know, enjoy the little things, don't touch your phone, don't, I don't want to hear, I don't want email on your phone, please don't put it on your phone, you know, use it on your laptop, your phone is for social. And I think we've all got a responsibility to encourage that, um, that mindset that, you know, it, work is not bad, work is great, I love my work, I love it, and there's often times where I'm productive at two in the morning. Um, but I choose that. But I'll balance it with something else that, you know, my family doesn't miss out. So I'll spend, you know, the time with my kids and my husband until they go to bed. And then, I, you know, I, I, my brain's buzzing and I want to get, um, get something done. So I'll, I will work, pull an all-nighter. But I'll also take the morning off the next day and go and visit someone or go for a walk. Or, you know, I don't climb Mount Everest, but I do go for a walk through my local bush track. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a way of balancing it. And it comes from the top down. You know, it comes from leaders and it comes from us setting the example so people know that it's OK um, and we can wipe that addiction. I think the leaders play a big, big part in that. I think in Australia, being busy has become a badge of honour. Um, so if, if you're not telling people that you're busy, you feel you're not succeeding because that's how we relate to success. So you, it, it just becomes this... And the word busy cycle. impacts the brain. It, it makes you feel stressed and stress is not good. It's not good for your health, it's not good for your um, mannerisms, it's not good for anything, it's not good for the energy that you put out into the world. So we've got to eliminate that word busy. Um, you know, when we're, we're doing work which is valuable and important, so we can need to recognise that. I've got two hands. Can I take this question? Can, can I just also say, just on the flip side as well, it's not... There's a lot of people in the room that probably don't work in front of a computer. Um, and and the, the other thing is that if you're working physically yeah. all day um, and you're tired, um, you know, how many people do, you know, have I treated over the years that have got bad backs, you know, bad shoulders, knees, you know, bad knees, bad <laughs> hips, all that sort of stuff. And if you're tired, that's when you're going to get injured. Um, you know, that's when you're going to make bad decisions, that's when accidents happen and stuff like that. So, you know, being aware as well that, you know, people who sit in front of computers get very mentally tired and often have to boost their energy by keeping physically strong. But if you work physically, often you get home and, you, you know, that's when you kind of just sit and, and um, often going out for a walk and stuff like that is often totally counterintuitive but can actually be really great for your mental health mm. as well, even though you've been physical all day. Because I think often what I see, probably where I came to mental health in the physio, physio word, world, is I'd be sitting there with a client you know, coming to me and he'd say, you know, look, you know, now my back's gone and my knees are gone, my hips are gone, how am I going to keep working? You know, I've got the, you know, a family to worry about, I've got kids at school. And in fact, the more you unpicked it, there was actually a lot of mental stress that was actually turning the volume up on that physical injury. And so often, instead of saying, I feel like I'm not coping anymore, it was all coming out in what was going on with their body. So, you know, often your body is a big barometer for what's going on with your mind, and it is still far more acceptable to say, I'm going off for a few days with a crook back or, or migraine, than it is to say, I'm going off because I'm depressed and, and I hate my boss. 
Um, so, you know, as a, as a leader and as an employer, if you've got um, people in your workplace that are going home sick a lot or with illness, that's often the time to have the are you okay conversation mm. because often that is the sign that, that your body's trying to tell you something, you yeah. know, and you might not even be aware that that's actually what's going on, but it's actually that first beacon on your dashboard saying, you know, think about True. it. True. We have two minutes left, so one more question. Really quick question. One of the things we're not talking about today is um, the fact that young people are actually growing up in an environment where their day is 24 hours a day, they're on. And we've talked now in the last section about us as adults in the workplace restricting our email access, restricting phone calls, managing different things. But we've got children growing up who are on all the time. So I'd particularly like to ask you, Graeme, what's a way that we can help young people, given that we know how high suicide is amongst young males in Australia? How can we help them to manage their lives? How can we show them the way forward? It's a really tough question, because you know, I've got kids as well that... Um are consumed at times by, you know, Instagram or whatever. And to be honest, I don't know the answer. Can I answer that? Because I have a teenager, uh, two teenagers. I've got a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old. Um, my 17-year-old um, was diagnosed as depressed with the school counsellor, and I'll tell you this very, very quickly. Um, once we got to the bottom of it, because I didn't accept the diagnosis, because I just didn't believe it, um, could have medicated him, could have gone down that road, but we decided to dig a little further because he was always cold. We thought he had a thyroid problem. So we got him diagnosed. Turned out he was celiac. And since he's gone off gluten, his mental health is fantastic and off the scale and he's productive and his grades have gone like that and he's whatever. But the kicker with all of it throughout the whole um, process when he was really suffering was we taught him good habits. We taught him how to put his... He's got to put his phone on a charger in the lounge room every night at 7 o'clock. He's allowed to check it once before he goes to bed. And he's really cool with that. And he is now... And that we've been doing that since, since he got a phone in the beginning, um, that he always puts it on the charger at night. But what it's turning out now, he's just going into year 12. And he does it himself. He uses the Forest app that cuts out everything else when he's studying. He will um, put his phone in another room when he's doing his homework. He doesn't have Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat. He deleted Snapchat for a week in the holidays just to give himself mental headspace. He understands it. It comes from us and we, we teach him um, because we've seen the damage that, you know, reliance on social media can, can be. And he's learned that his friends don't fall off a cliff when he's not around and that it's actually OK, and he can catch up with things. And people now know that if they want to contact him, they have to call him before 7 o'clock. And so I think just as we as adults have to learn, they intrinsically know they have to do it, and they know that, you know, even... I mean, I think it's a different brain structure. I mean, we could go right into the science behind it, and there's, there's people that know this much better than, than me, but um, I'm just talking from experience of being a mum this has really helped my son, is teaching him how to um, put it away. And my daughter as well, she just does it naturally now. Um, and we lead by example. If we're not on our phones all the time, they won't be. A very big conversation. Yeah. I agree with that 100%. And we have to keep pushing for it. Yeah. It's like someone lurching in behind it you, is, isn't it? Lurch, <laughs> lurch. But anyway, um, I, can I just say one thing? I just want to thank you all. You have been amazing. There is so much more to this conversation. We haven't touched on bullying in the workplace. We haven't touched on you know, the younger generation. We haven't touched on a bunch of things. There's only so much you can fit into an hour. Um, so I do encourage you to get in touch with these incredible people and take that conversation further. Um, and talk to people in your workplace and talk to people at the institutions, talk to people at the universities, start getting, you know, systems into place that we can support each other because it is such an incredible, incredible conversation um, to have. So I commend you all for being here. Thank you for giving up your time to um, 
to invest in this incredible conversation and I hope you enjoy the rest of this fabulous day. But thank you, Emma, for putting it on. So I'm sure you'll join me, everyone, in thanking our panel. Thank you. Thank you.